In 1996, Resident Evil saved Capcom from bankruptcy. The publisher was one of the last to commit to 2D gaming during the transition over to 3D, speaking to a reluctance to adapt from older leadership that got smashed out of the way when the reins were handed to younger talent. Shinji Mikami ushered in their next mainstream mega-hit with a shambled limp. For such a keystone of gaming history, Resident Evil began as a startlingly scrappy production. With quirky missteps covering everything from them using the first foreigners who showed up at their Osaka auditions for actors, to the arguments behind the scenes that had the story material rushed out late. As the development of Resident Evil 2 became problematic, they realized that these were mistakes they didn't want to make again, even though they made a big mistake of printing the game on two discs. Regardless, they diligently outsourced to an actual talent studio for their voice actors and didn't use live-action cutscenes at all. They also employed the consultation of Power Rangers and Kamen Rider screenwriter Noboru Sugimura to doctor their scripts, and they also did a lot of interviewing and press touring to promote the sequel before it was out. Unfortunately, they did a lot of dwelling on that cancelled prototype during those interviews. The mythical allure of that cancelled Resident Evil 1.5 prototype persists to this day, inspiring much of the moves that an entirely new remake has made that has, mechanically speaking at least, ended up as less of a remake than it is a whole new game that just takes place in the same story. And 21 years of video game development evolving, legitimizing, and standardizing itself as a formal field of study has really changed things. After recently replaying both, I got a good dose of a good trend that I've been noticing in a lot of good games this generation. The remake of Resident Evil 2 is actually more difficult and more demanding, but you might not immediately feel that because it is less punishing. Well, it's got a hell of a lot more complicated control scheme, but the real reason I say that is that the remake uses some bold new rules for how to calculate a damage model in an action game. I first played the game on hardcore mode, where zombies can take anywhere from just 3 to 11 headshots to kill. It's, it's really inconsistent. But I tried to get myself into the horror mood of playing an unpredictable spooky game with unpredictable spooky rules and work with that for a day. It was about four hours in when I think I realized the developer's idea here was to make the reward for accurate shooting a dazed zombie rather than a dead zombie. Non-critical headshots don't do any more damage than non-critical body or limb shots, but they do carry a chance to activate a stun that renders the zombie harmless for a little while. And this is an effect you can trigger with less bullets by hitting their legs. Inching this game a lot closer to... Dead Space? than traditional Resident Evil? It's actually safer to stun zombies rather than kill them, and I've heard mixed opinions on that paradigm. It's a conflict between skill and strategy. You can't exactly flick shot your way through a corridor blocked by zombies with perfect timing and perfect aim with characters this floppy and slow. The combat itself can be unpredictable and inconsistent, but you can smartly keep your distance, minimize the chances of danger, and lure zombies together or out of your way to consolidate risk. And right now, I'm all for that. In addition to further specializing the purpose of more valuable ammo that does kill them with headshots, this fits the RE mythos of T-Virus zombies being tough as nails in the lore in the cutscenes of the previous game, and the classic zombie movie jump scare gags of not being able to tell if they're really dead or not. Though I'm not ready to start arguing canon rules over fictional creatures that don't exist. For sure, Night of the Living Dead zombies die if you shoot them in the head, but Return of the Living Dead zombies don't. How do you kill something that's already dead? Well, how do I know, Fred? I don't know. Let me think. It's not a bad question, Bert. So if the zombie rules of Resident Evil are suddenly going to change, that's not exactly unprecedented nor a cataclysmic change in the series' tone. The real world is going to keep turning regardless. Try to remember the confusion of learning those rules during your own first playthrough of the original RE2. Knocked down zombies do deceive you into pretending that they're permanently dead. It's the big pool of blood that gives it away, and even then there's still some post-postmortem twitching going on that creeped me the hell out for the first couple hours. Just as in back then, the remake has some deceptive aesthetics and rules that are evoking the horror of, of questioning how you're supposed to kill something that's already dead. And on top of that, I seem to be juggling just the right amount of ammo during that critical first run where I was figuring it all out. In fact, ammo placement almost seemed sublime, with new bullets and herbs popping up almost always as soon as I was running out, owing to a dynamic difficulty system that's a hell of a lot more sadistic than the original game too. The remake requires a lot more ammo out of you, a lot more situational awareness out of you, a lot less zombies to be killed by you, and a lot more strategic decisions to be making overall. Right down to sometimes having to pay attention to which floor tiles your character's feet are stepping on when a limbless zombie is nearby still trying to chomp at your ankles. 
And from all those new decisions that have to be made come a more dynamic and creative game design. One where players can juke zombies into false grabs, or make use of a lightweight stealth system, or toss a grenade to sprint past them. Despite the heightened difficulty, options are always available to use way less ammo and take way less hits than the original to make it past this undead horde. There's a much larger matrix of decisions to make in every encounter, and these encounters can play out in many different ways. Whereas in the original, a lot of your decision making is simply going to boil down to whether you want to spend health or ammo to make it past the next corridor. And remember all that sublime ammo placement I was raving about earlier? Turns out, pay attention to the gunpowder items and suddenly your bullet supply is going to make a whole lot more sense. Once again, you've got options. And once again, that was something I didn't really figure out until after enduring a spooky and unpredictable learning curve that was very satisfying to climb. I also have to just like prostrate myself on the ground and praise another product of 21 years of cutting edge high tech super improvements. You can now separate your stacks. So you don't gotta make a return trip to an item box after saving, so you can carry only like two or three extra bullets in a slot for a bit of extra ammo that will turn into a free space after you consume it. Inventory management is less of an everything or nothing question and so is the combat, and a lot of subtle features gently balance the game to be more difficult to counterbalance how much more versatile your playstyle is and how much more conservative it can be. It's a faster playstyle too. A lack of loading screens on doors means that making up for lost progress after death even on hardcore mode with ink ribbon saves and no checkpoints can happen fast. And that's a luxury that the original game has no equivalent for. Die just three rooms away from a save room and you're still looking at three to four minutes to make up that lost progress, whereas in the remake, you're looking at more like 45 seconds. Both games are great, and there's a lot of fun comparisons to note between the two of them the whole way through. So let's do this by just walking through the games from beginning to end. In both cases, you begin in very different locations that both show off the same daring concept, an unforgiving tutorial. Whether it's the gas station of the remake or the burning streets of the original, it's quite likely to get eaten by the very first zombie you see in either game. But without a whole lot of places to go, besides planes through the zombies rather than away or past them, they teach you the most important thing to learn into any RE game. How to move strategically and safely when close to zombies, and just how darn important it is to not get close to them at all. And both openings are going to teach you that stuff fast. And again, 21 years of game design show that developers have learned a lot when it comes to teaching. The original game puts about 10 to 15 minutes worth of potential death and required combat before reaching your first save point, whereas the remake's version of Raccoon City lasts only about one minute. Zombies smartly placed away from you provide a threat that can be avoided without combat, but once again, they're placed kind of in lanes that lead you to the station. And this is where the magic of the remake begins, by remaking RE2 not as it was, but how it's been remembered. Note that all the same rooms are in all the same places on the map across both games. The size of everything seems to have been scaled up across the board, but it's the perimeter hallways connecting them that got the more intensive redesigning. The eastern office has been mirrored, perhaps because you enter it from the other side this time. The library has been turned into a much bigger kind of combat arena where you have the deliciously rare opportunity to take the high ground, and stairs have been placed to connect the main lobby with the two second floor wings above. And going back to the original, I was really surprised by not seeing those stairs. I thought I remembered them there. The two ramps leading up to one ladder had left kind of a mental impression of stairs that got filled in once I started playing the remake. The whole process of getting upstairs and downstairs is way easier, and so is the mental image of police officers being able to move around their own station without having to smack down an emergency ladder. The doors up there are locked in the remake anyway. The upstairs is still inaccessible like in the original. The stairs just save you time and trouble. They make the interior design make more sense and they really just tie the whole room together. That's what I enjoy so much about what they did with the police station in the remake. There's a lot more going on, but thankfully it takes less time to sift through it all and it feels more coherent and tightly directed while you do it. Begin walking out of the lobby and the death of Officer 50% off here is excellent foreshadowing for when you are in a similar situation minutes later. In the original, the backtracking can feel uneventful, no thanks to the pace of your character's movement and the door loading screens. Another big example is the clock tower. The gear and the crank you need to complete the clock tower in OG RE2 are located at opposite ends of some later game rooms while the tower itself is unlocked quite early on. 
In both games, it's a long trip up there, and in the original, it's possible to waste a lot of time repeatedly backtracking to and from up there because it needs multiple items inside, and you have no idea what the second item you're looking for is gonna be until after you use up the first. But in the remake, they make sure you gotta make that trip only once. Once you build a bridge up to the third floor fairly late into your time at the station, the clock tower is open to you and everything you need in there is already inside. But despite streamlining the level design, it's not lacking for content, and it also doesn't shy away from incorporating backtracking when and where it feels purposeful. That clock tower room, it's just an isolated nub off of a new third floor connecting hallway. You're not going to use that room twice, but you will be likely to use that hallway at least twice. Thanks to stuff like the locker combinations, the extra new medallions, the broken button panel, and the lever-activated slide puzzle in the library, you've got a much greater density of activities that still carry meaningful rewards that unlock new areas of the station. They can even fold into interesting combat setups, like having to juke enemies around puzzle pieces as you work with them, and combining that extra puzzles with more difficult combat is a combination that demands more specific planning from the player. Your thought process is less, okay, let's bring some ammo and a single healing item to use the heart key on the one door that requires it on the other side of the station, than it is, okay, let's hit the third floor locker on the way down to the photo room while also dropping off some boards and nails and windows on the way. If Mr. X shows up, I'm gonna bring enough ammo to change routes and go the longer way through whatever floor he's not guarding. Only four or five bullets though in case I need that spot for the puzzle item. If he's behind me and zombies are in front of me, zombie legs gonna have to go. Otherwise, let's save the ammo. OG RE2 is less dense on several layers. Movement speed and combat are slower, there's less puzzles per distance, there's no room for combining red and blue herbs for shield run strats, there's just less decision to make in any given second of the game you're playing overall. But hopefully it's not too controversial for me to also claim that both games start to lose their luster when you work your way out of the police station and into the sewers. Slow movement, ammo conservation, and limited visibility are not exactly conducive to the kind of face-to-face, one-on-one duels that boss fights usually are. Across the entirety of the series, if we're including both the over-the-shoulder and fixed camera REs, there are a lot of Resident Evil bosses that aren't great. Within the over-the-shoulder games, there are some Resident Evil bosses that are great. Unfortunately, the RE2 Remake's bosses fall into the former category. And the RE2 Originals as well. Hell, at least you can get those over with quicker, unlike this 10-minute toilet spiral of never-ending sprinting. For the most part, the real memorable bosses haven't happened yet during RE2's original release. I mean, Giant Snake taps into some instinctive ancestral fear damn well, but you just kind of stand in one spot and dump ammo its way. The Nemesis, though, they got some right ideas with him. An unseen stalker that tracks you that must be avoided rather than directly fought fits the style, the control scheme, and the item distribution of these games way better. And in the remake, we have a nemesis yet again. Mr. X stalks you from room to room with AI following similar rules and, at least during one moment, he appeared to teleport from one end of the station to another to block my routes, which I thought was kind of bullshit, until I learned that four to five bullets to the head is all it takes to have more than enough time to just run right past him. And for future playthroughs, that frustration also went away. He became another dynamic and strategic element, something to plan around, someone who'd trigger sudden improvisational moments of combat or evasion. It's interesting that I actually completely forgot that he was in the original game. It's weird as hell that I thought there were stairs in the original game, and I just thought that Mr. X was a totally new element original to the remake. Because in the original, he doesn't strike me as much of an event. You just kind of back up, bait him into a swing, run away, and then he leaves you alone for hours. Your total time spent with him is not likely to add up to more than a couple minutes. Not counting his boss fight. Maybe it's because I played the game a few years after its prime, but I genuinely forgot. I completely forgot Mr. X was even there. Anyways, Leon's sewer campaign is more faithful to the original, with a brief segment of Zeta Wong to connect the dots in the sewer, but if you're playing as Claire, you don't change to Sherry for block puzzles in the sewer, but rather as Sherry for a stealth escape scene in an orphanage, and I'm also really not a big fan of that segment too. Maybe because I was playing on hardcore. This segment requires very precise timing and positioning, and for players on hardcore mode, it's in sorely in need of at least a single 
single typewriter. Because of the length of this segment and its passive nature of just standing around waiting for its scripted events to complete, and the fragility of your stealth visibility, and the time it takes to get back to where you left off if you die, it was the one part in the remake where I actually was stuck for most of an hour and did not have fun figuring out how to get out. The, uh, the, 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 the G-Virus Birkin boss at the construction site was a close second. This boss is borderline a puzzle boss. Its weakness is vague and discovered via experimentation, and yet the penalty for your experiment failing is so high that it discourages experimentation. This is the kind of boss that's just a frustrating trial and error replay fest during the first run, and then he becomes mechanically executed procedure during future runs. And he bookends a sewer level that isn't exactly an interesting place to be. In 1998, games like Resident Evil 2 and Half-Life were standardizing the banality of sewer levels while also proving that great gameplay could steal the spotlight from a drab setting. But in the original, the sewer and its associated treatment facility are just almost a footnote in the overall experience. It's a quick connector between the police station and the labs that barely lasts an hour, one with a series of tunnels so narrow and so packed with zombies that its purpose almost feels like an ammo dump so they can slim your supplies down for the labs coming up later. But in the remake, the sewers are an expansive three-floor complex that is not very analogous to the original layout. The fan tunnel and three-story valve active bridge are more like visual homages you see only once and don't return to, rather than the critical connecting corridors they were in the original, and I guess they decided giant spiders were cheesy. In the original game, the sewers are mostly straight, linear, flat tunnels. In the remake, there's all sorts of levels to this place, connected by elevators, water slides, and staircases, and a unique blobby enemy added in with an associated new unique weapon if you're playing as Claire. And I especially like the rooms leading in and out of the chess piece maze that gets you that weapon for her campaign. Combat with the new G-Virus monsters is required at least once to show you their core moves before giving you sneaking and evasion options for the next two, before giving you a specialized weapon that one-shots them away. This stretch does not play as well if you're Leon. Especially since they kinda squandered another opportunity to make an old boss cool again. Well, less of a boss than a QTE scare, but... Yeah, I thought we'd learn by now that basically any time your character is running towards the camera in a video game, players are gonna be stumbling and tumbling their way through a bunch of stuff they can't see coming. Seems like they did a damn good, fantastic, bang-up job reimagining everything in this game. Except for bosses. This is also a segment that's not very compatible with hardcore ink ribbon saves, as is basically any segment with these one-shot deaths. It's a reminder that classic RE actually had a whole lot less of those before checkpoint retrying became a thing, and that's, that's, that's actually maybe the biggest reason why they're easier. Anyways. The radically redesigned levels between the police station and the labs lead to a more nostalgically redesigned set of labs. The hub looks just like how I remembered it, and while it has you going from East Wing to West Wing like how I remembered it too, most of the rooms here are actually brand spanking new. A couple new zombie infested cafeteria rooms have been added that provide probably your greatest test of stealth yet, and the power fuse that opens up the opposite wing is now a wristband instead. The fuse is homage during a chemical mixing puzzle that has you circling around a new basement area, one that is yet again explicitly designed more for combat than anything you've seen prior. This is the stage of the game where, like all good Resident Evils, a focus on action is supposed to be providing a cathartic payoff for all the slow, quiet, creepy spooks from earlier. And more opportunities to point a gun and shoot things are provided thanks to Ivy zombies that, just like the common zombies, are far more resilient enemies this time. They require double the fire to permanently kill, and the extra shoulder room to kite them out of your way is given to facilitate those changes. In the original game, you encounter them in a cramped connector and a long vertical shaft, and here they have a slightly less cramped connector and the shaft is just chopped off entirely. Replaced with a spacious combat arena that gives you enough room to make a clean getaway on your way to and from some additional new puzzles that also take you down to some entirely new combat-centric areas in the basement. Just like with the sewers, the whole process of going through the labs is going to take much longer than the original game's awkwardly quick interval spent in its later areas. For real. In the original game, this self-destruct timer triggers pretty much as soon as the atmosphere and spooks of the lab are just getting good. But it's once again bosses that seem to get less of a dose of reimagining, particularly with the giant stage 4G monster that 
grows on top of William Birkin and then has you circling around a train car forever, almost as repetitively and uneventfully as the back and forth you do with it in the original game. A minigun tries to supplement the spectacle, but with characters this much slower in gameplay compared to their cutscenes, the game's not exactly going to be fooling anyone into making this boss fight look more exciting than it is. But regardless, I appreciate the effort, and I can totally endure a couple bad boss fights in an otherwise excellent remake slash reimagining slash rebuilding as an entirely new different game anyway. I think it's especially ironic to note that, perhaps due to its development reboot, Resident Evil 2 was an extremely short game that lived on longer through replays, alternate campaigns, and extra modes, and that is what the extra difficulty and the extra learning curve of the remake so elegantly encourage. Load it up for the B run for a more difficult campaign, and just as in the original, you've hopefully learned where and how to shoot zombies, which ones are actually useful to permanently kill, and what a more optimal run through looks like. But for the remake, the extra HP and the headshot rules end up really changing the mood of those future playthroughs, where the layer of horror gets stripped away to reveal a layer of strategy. It's a game that grows on you with replays. I've gone through it like three times and it hasn't yet gotten old. <laughs> in a way that only a game with dynamism and a satisfying learning curve can. It's an unpredictable and inconsistent horror game at first that becomes a polished and surprisingly balanced action game. Just one with a really slow pace and a lot of shadows to hide the finer points of its rules under. And that's a faithful interpretation of one of the founding design philosophies of Resident Evil. To quote Resident Evil 1 director Shinji Mikami, To me, survival horror is a balance between a scary kind of gameplay and the challenge of overcoming that fear. You get a sense of achievement out of that. So if you've ever wondered why these games typically end in generic metal labs spammed with enemies who fall down to increasingly bigger guns, that's why. That is supposed to be the power fantasy here. It's the process of turning from a scared baby fumbling with the controls into a graceful warrior with the confidence to just hell, run right past like half the enemies now that you know how slow they are. And the Resident Evil 2 remake beautifully captures that process, from fumbling around with our characters' slow, unresponsive turning and their clumsy sprinting, to not even knowing if I was actually doing damage at all to these zombies, and to something that looks like Die Hard, except everyone's sloppy drunk once I was on that third replay. The action-oriented Resident Evil games, at least the good ones, are finely tuned white-knuckle shooters with responsive controls, liberating game design, and some more forgiving rules than what you may initially expect. I mean, for one, has anyone ever noticed how hard it is to actually hurt yourself with your own grenades? And this is why I don't mind the move to the over-the-shoulder camera here. I miss fixed camera angles, but I'm not gonna go through life requiring them. There's a balance between horror and action that the new game design strikes. Your camera is zoomed in enough to limit visibility, and they have your character slow enough to foment a claustrophobic feel, but quickly shooting off some legs and then weaving your way through crowds of the stun animations with finesse is not going to be super doable with the old camera system. In the old games, claustrophobia and horror are evoked by controls and camera work. And don't get me wrong, I will relish the day when some good horror games come out that use that system again. But in the new game, horror is evoked with game rules, with that damage model. It's evoked by zombies that that, true to the classic literature, just seem to keep on coming no matter what you throw at them. During my first run with the game, for the first time in years, every single zombie felt like a real threat again. They felt like the real toxic, biohazardous messes of pathogens they've always been said to be. Each one is a long distance hazard that feels like you shouldn't get anywhere within 12 feet of them. And I feel like the learning curve of figuring them out needs to be respected. It's like the learning curve itself is creating so many of the spooks here. After all, the greatest fear is the fear of the unknown. And few games so confidently exploit the learning curves of games themselves to create a feeling of survival horror.